friends and welcome back. Are you a woman in midlife suffering from insomnia, hot flashes, depression, anxiety, or brain fog? Could it be hormonal? I'm Dr. V, board certified endocrinologist and certified menopause practitioner here to talk to you today about perimenopause and the menopause transition. So first, a little terminology. The menopause transition is defined as the time when women start to have their first menstrual irregularities or their first perimenopausal symptoms and extends until the final menstrual period. On average, it lasts about five years, but sometimes can last can be shorter, as uh, short as a couple years to as long as like seven years. Perimenopause starts at the same time as the menopausal transition does, but extends until 12 months or a year after the final menstrual period. The menopausal transition is broken up into early and late stages. The early menopausal transition is marked by menstrual irregularities of seven days or more, like you might get your period, your period a week early or a week late, but it's still generally coming every month. The late menopausal transition is marked by skipped periods, so you might have 60 days without a period. The average age of the menopausal transition onset is 46 years, but can really range a lot from as early as 39 to as late as say 51 years. And really the only thing predictable about the menopausal transition is that it's unpredictable. So to better understand this and give us some context, we're gonna do a quick primer on how our normal hormones normally function during the reproductive years. The, the menstrual cycle is divided into two halves or two phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. During the first half of the menstrual cycle, the pituitary releases a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone, hence the name follicular phase, um, and that's abbreviated FSH. FSH goes to the ovaries and stimulates a follicle to mature, grow, and secrete, and, and it secretes estrogen. Um, it also secretes a hormone called inhibin B which forms a closed loop feedback system back to the pituitary gland and shuts down FSH. The egg also produces estro estradiol or estrogen. Once those estrogen levels reach a peak or a, a certain threshold, it stimulates the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone or LH, which then triggers ovulation, which is the release of an egg from its follicle. The shell of the follicle that's left behind is called the corpus luteum and starts to secrete progesterone in the second half of the menstrual cycle. And that half, because it's uh, from the corpus luteum, is called the luteal phase. During the menopausal transition, the number of eggs begin to decline. And so there's less inhibin B around to go back and do that negative feedback loop and inhibit FSH secretion. So you start to see increased FSH levels. Initially, that increased FSH or those higher FSH levels stimulate faster follicular maturation and ovulation. And so that first half of the cycle, the follicular phase will get shorter and women will start to see that they're getting their periods a little more frequently. Where before one might have gotten their period every 30 days, maybe now they're getting them every 28 or 29 days. This also means that women are spending proportionally more time in the luteal phase, which is the part of the uh, cycle where women get the most PMS type symptoms. So it might feel like you're just having periods all the time or you're just in PMS all the time. Eventually, when you know as time progresses, the number of eggs continues to decline. And when there's very, very few eggs left, then the cycles start to get longer and then they will drop. So initially, cycles get shorter and then they'll get longer and then you might skip one. These higher FSH levels can also sometimes lead to recruitment of a second follicle. Yes, that means that you might ovulate two times in the same cycle. And when that happens, estradiol levels can get really high, like in the thousands. And if you're someone who tends to get estrogen-related symptoms, such as nausea, breast tenderness, or uh, hormonal migraines, then if this happens to you on a cycle, you may uh, experience a cycle that, that has a lot more symptoms than others. But not every woman is going to experience symptoms related to the perimenopause and not every cycle is going to be the same. But let's go through some of the more common ones. The first one I'm going to talk about is hot flushes. In the past, we've kind of been under the misconception that this starts mainly after the final menstrual period, but we're understanding more and more that this 
often, you know, the worst symptoms that women have can be during the menopausal transition and that they're starting, um, that they start earlier and last longer than we had previously believed. In the study for women's health across the nation, which is abbreviated as SWAN, women reported uh, frequent hot flashes for a median of seven years. It's hard to say exactly how long hot flashes will, will last. Uh, what we know is that African-American women tend to experience them the longest. And if you start having hot flushes earlier in the menopausal transition, um, statistically, you're more likely to have them longer. Actually, one of the best ways to um, predict how long hot flushes uh, will last for you or what they will be like is to ask your mom. They tend to um, be very similar from um, mother to daughter. And the great news is that Hormonal therapy is very effective in treating hot flushes. If you happen to have a contraindication and cannot take estrogen or progesterone, um, there are also uh, several non-prescription therapies available as well. The second one I'm gonna to talk to you about are cognitive changes, often referred to as brain fog. This encompasses changes in attention, concentration, language and learning, memory, problem solving, and reasoning. It's not clear whether or not hormonal treatment of hot flushes during the menopausal transition will affect cognition. Definitely more research is needed there. However, some studies have shown that lifestyle choices can impact or improve memory. Um, and those inc would include um, staying physically and mentally active, keeping a diet that's high in omega-3 fatty acids, not smoking, uh, keeping alcohol to a minimum, um, or uh, drinking in moderation and reducing your cardiovascular risk by making sure that your diet, uh, if you have diabetes, that that's very well controlled, controlling your blood pressure as well as your cholesterol. The third one I'm going to talk to you about is sleep disturbance. The late menopausal transition and the early postmenopause is the period in women's life that tends to have the most impact on sleep. Perimenopausal women compared to pre and postmenopausal women are more likely to report that they sleep less than seven hours in a 24 hour period. 25% of them have trouble falling asleep and 30% of them have trouble staying asleep. So the theory here is that perimenopausal related insomnia is due to hot flushes waking women up or sleep disturbance um, that inhibits how deep women sleep, but not to the point of completely waking them up. However, not all insomnia during midlife is due to perimenopause. There are a lot of other conditions that can cause disturbance in sleep, such as obstructive sleep apnea, periodic limb movements of sleep, restless leg syndrome, or primary insomnia. So we shouldn't assume that just because you're a perimenopausal woman that your sleep disturbance is from perimenopause. If you are having trouble sleeping, the insomnia severity index or the Pittsburgh sleep quality index are good screening measures. If you score high, then a referral to a sleep specialist may be indicated. The last one I'm gonna to talk to you about today is depression and anxiety. The menopausal transition and the early postmenopause constitutes a window of vulnerability for depression and anxiety. The study of women's health across the nation found a two to four fold increase in clinical depression during the menopausal transition. Depressive symptoms are strongly associated with vasomotor symptoms, and Hispanic women seem to be a vulnerable ethnic group compared to other groups. Antidepressants remain the first-line therapy. However, there are some compelling studies who, that have come out to suggest that transdermal estrogen may be an option for treatment of, of depressive symptoms in women in the menopausal transition with concurrent vasomotor symptoms. Unfortunately, the use of estrogen therapy in postmenopausal women hasn't been as promising. So to sum it up, hot flushes, brain fog, depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbance can be very common symptoms of the menopausal transition. Although not all women will experience negative symptoms, some have very minimal symptoms, but for others, they can be quite significant. The good news is that the menopausal transition will not last forever and most symptoms will improve in the postmenopause. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, click like below and subscribe. I'm Dr. V with Endocrinology, helping you with all your hormone needs and to find your perfect balance. Thanks again. Hasta luego.